Welcome to Digging History. I'm your host, James McCormick. Corbett Perkins, who is usually with me, is on another assignment today. We're just two veterans out digging our way into history and using our love for history as a part of our therapy as we navigate life after service. This show is all about bringing together veterans, history, and the love of relic hunting to tell the story of those who served long ago. This show will tell the history of America and locate those precious artifacts and properly display and preserve them for the sake of history. We bring together technology, including metal detectors, maps, and even drone technology needed to locate, film, and document these discoveries, allowing all citizens to see, and in some cases, touch items that are in many cases older than the state of West Virginia. The veterans we work with on these projects will have the opportunity to tell their own story and in the course of these expeditions find some therapeutic value of the experience and fellowship that these great adventures provide. Now today we will be in Nicholas County, West Virginia, the site of many Civil War encounters, but two we will focus on are the battles at Carnifex Ferry and Kessler's Cross Lanes where we had access to private property locations that allows us to gain a wider perspective of those battles and also learn that these fights stretched out much further than we thought. So sit back and enjoy the show, folks. And remember that under the current COVID-19 situation, we must all do our very best to social distance, wear proper PPE, and maintain good hygiene practices so that we not only protect ourselves, but also other citizens of our great state and nation. And I'd like to further say thank you to everyone for watching this show. And today we're with uh, Byron Tucker and we're in Nicholas County, West Virginia, and uh, on his private property. And we like to keep people's property private, but uh, he has found some amazing artifacts uh, in and around Nicholas County on his property and today we're hoping to get out and do a little bit of searching but before we do that I wanted to let Byron take a minute number one and introduce himself and then show you some of these artifacts but the first one I'm going to grab is this cannonball yep. and I want you to tell him about oh the story about this cannonball right here. I, uh, it was in October of the year when I found this cannonball and the signal actually uh, rang up. I believed I had found a, uh, a gun barrel, and it was uh, down about 16 or 18 inches, and the cannonball was upside down. All I could see was the smooth bottom of it, and on, I was uh, I dug it up, and all, I, I didn't know how the timers worked. I couldn't remember, and all at once I heard something start ticking, and I thought, well, that was a spring-loaded timer. <laughs> and I was afraid I'd just set something up to explode. Right. And I waited a little while and found out and realized it was a leaf that the wind was blowing. And it just happened to be hitting my shovel just right to make a ticking sound. But then I dug further and saw that it had the uh, timer intact. Well, then I absolutely knew that the cannonball had not exploded. Mm -hmm. And... Didn't know for sure how to handle it, so I brought it in and left it outside because if it was explosive, I didn't want it to blow my house up and called an acquaintance mm -hmm. of mine in Alabama and he told me to keep it in a bucket of water mm -hmm. to keep it wet in case it did activate. And then I located someone in Richmond, Virginia that made arrangements to get a hole drilled in it to dump the black powder out of it and uh, they, the gentleman used, from what I was told, the way he done it, he has a remote control drill press mm -hmm. that he has a video camera on it and has water blowing onto it all the time. And he controls that drill press to drill a hole in it. And the water keeps the powder from getting hot and exploding. And he told me that after he dumped it out, that he burnt the black powder. He said it was still dry enough to burn. Wow. Since then, and this battle where this was found was on uh, September the 10th, 1861. Wow. So it's been several years. So so the, the point that we make with this is, is that 
any kind of ordinance can be dangerous if you don't handle it properly. Absolutely, absolutely. So that is an awesome find. That is, and, and it's heavy, folks. I'm telling you, you can see the uh, uh, the timer on there, and uh, and you've just found some other and, and amazing artifacts. Now this bayonet, I wanted you to kind of talk about it, but also talk about the tip that you accidentally broke. But uh, I got the signal, and of course, it, it showed, made me believe that it was possibly a rifle barrel with a long, narrow signal this way. And as I was digging it, it was there was a small root under it, and I broke the end of it off accidentally. And with my research from where it was found, it was found there. It, it should have been Union. There was only. Union soldiers in the area. There's no reports that there was ever any Confederate soldiers in that area. So I feel sure that it was a Union bayonet. Mm -hmm. And what I, I preserved part of it, I put it in electrolysis to clean a little bit. Then I put a product called Gimpler's Rust Converter on part of it. That's the black. And I left part of it without it for a comparison and partly for my own knowledge to watch and see some deterioration, to see how long it would last, see what would happen with it. Sure. You know, that's, and how long have you had this out of the ground? Uh, Three years, probably. Three years. That's an amazing find. And then you've got all sorts of other things. You've got a cannonball fragment over there. We've got bullets. Um, you know, some of my, th these are my favorite bullets to find, actually. It's these big, oh, yeah. I call these the big honking 69 calibers, you know. And, uh, you know, that was the early war uh, version. And then, of course, the Irish Regiment, which I have a lot of family members that were in, they continued to use that 69 caliber smoothbore with the buck and ball round. They yeah. really liked using the buck and ball round. And uh, there you go. <laughs> you yeah. get in this container... Wow. There's a lot of the the buck buckshot in there. That's amazing. And so all of this stuff uh, from these battles occurred around 1861 in this area. Now I'm sure you had some occupation troops here. Right. They they passed through this area quite a bit for two or three more years. The this uh, Carnifex Ferry was a major crossroads as they were traveling in this area, and Summersville was. A, a central location. Now this is a rifle tool, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's... best I could uh, research, it's probably a Springfield rifle tool. Mm -hmm. And that's just amazing that you find, you know, and some of these tools and things that you find. Uh, so that's connected. So what is that? That would have been uh, a door latch. It's probably not war related, but it would have had a hasp right that is in so there. Cool. And swung Somebody it over. Made then, that. Yeah, that's that was made by a blacksmith, I'm sure, in a shop. And then you know we actually so you've probably found just uh, loads and loads of bullets like the rest of us have have found. And and so what would be your coolest find that you've ever found? What you would call your prize? I'm sure the cannonball the, ranks up there with that. Yeah, the cannonball is uh, pretty high. The bayonet was. Pretty. I was pretty happy with the bayonet because that I think is unusual, uncommon for someone to lose a bayonet. Mm -hmm. That was a pretty major, pretty major tool for a soldier, mm -hmm. and I, that somebody was really in a bad situation once they realized they lost that. And you're a veteran too. Yep. You were in the Navy. Navy. Tell us a little bit about your service. Uh, it was just short term. I was uh, at Great Lakes, Illinois for about four months uh -huh. and uh, was uh, medically discharged mm -hmm. with ulcers, okay. bleeding ulcers. I'll be darn. But uh, the, then I, I noticed that you have a long line of family members. Your son, retired yep. Marine. Our, our uh, older son's a retired Marine. And what he's talking about, we have a display of pictures of our family that has served in the military and my dad, grandparents, for several generations back, and a real interesting part of that, one of the pictures up there, my wife's grandparents came from Russia in uh -huh. 1910, and before they became, he became a United States citizen, he fought in the Argonne Forest in World War One, 
and he wasn't even a United States citizen yet. And wow. we've, we've got a handwritten will of his, and for the address he put that he was located somewhere in the Argonne Forest with U.S. Expeditionary Forces. And it, to me, it's pretty, pretty important. This man wasn't even a citizen of this country and Fighting for fought it. for us. Yeah, it kind of it kind of is uh, goes into play with when I studied my family history. Most of them were they were all mainly Irish that came over, immigrants that came over, and in the Civil War there were five brothers, and four of them fought for the Union, and one moved to Virginia, and he was pressed into service. Said pressed into service under the gun, which meant he was made to go. Uh. He was wounded at Cloyd's Mountain, and uh, but we have one of the brothers as a Medal of Honor recipient was in the Navy. Um, on the uh, USS Signal, and then the others fought in the uh, the New York Irish Brigade. You mm. know, they just um, and and you know fought in some of the most horrific battles of the Civil War, and, and lived to tell it. So that's an interesting time in our period. Of, now you found something else that, there. This was an interesting find. There's a bullet in this piece of wood. Mm -hmm. So this tree would have been standing during the day of the battle. And so the tree grew and finally fell down. And to find a bullet in the piece of wood, that was just an interesting find. Yeah. It, it's uncommon, I think. And it was just an Very interesting uncommon. find. Very uncommon. Well, we're going to get to digging, folks. And uh, we're going to shoot some video from the field. And uh, hopefully we'll find some more cool things today. Uh, out here with Byron. So, good. Keep watching. And I'm going to give y'all a little lesson on the Battle of Ke Kessler's Cross Lanes, or also known as the Battle of Niza Forks. On the 26th of August, 1861, which is about almost 159 years ago, uh, the Battle of Kessler's Cross Lanes took place with uh, um, the forces of Colonel Tyler, <clears throat> which had nine companies of the 7th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, and Brigadier General John B. Floyd with his forces of the 22nd Virginia Infantry, 36th Virginia Infantry, 45th Virginia Infantry, the 50th Virginia Infantry, and Lieutenant Thomas E. Jackson's horse artillery with some cavalry and possibly some other uh, units as well. But when Tyler moved into the area, he did not place his forces correctly. They were too close. Not only that, but he didn't put out his pickets like he was supposed to, so he didn't have lookouts to warn him that Floyd was around. And General Cox, he was the commanding officer of Western, the Army of Western Virginia, even warned Tyler to uh, beware because he had reports that Floyd and Wise's armies both were in the area. So his lack of giving a boop, uh, yeah, cost him a great deal. Um, General Floyd, that evening of the 20, or the night of the 25th, after Tyler got made camp and everything, um, which Tyler, for some reason, ordered that none of the there be no fires be lit except for one, which was at the intersection. Uh, so his men slept in the cold because they didn't take but one day what they could carry, one day's rations, and um, no blankets or anything because the, the supply and the baggage train was back at a place called Peter's Creek because um, they didn't think they were going to be there that long, I guess. But uh, Floyd, since Tyler didn't put out pickets and whatever and didn't set his men up correctly, Floyd had his scouts watch Tyler's every movement while he was moving his forces closer to, uh, to attack. So early on the morning of the 26th, it was a report, it, it's reported that it was a cold and misty morning and the 7th Ohio got up for breakfast, which consisted of crackers, uh, roast beef from the cattle that Floyd's men slaughtered the day before, uh, some coffee, and green corn. I've heard of green eggs and ham, but never green corn. But that had to be nasty. Um, that's the reason why it's called the Battle of Knives and Forks. Uh, 
because they were eating breakfast when uh, Floyd decided to attack. It was basically a bloodbath and, and a massacre. Um, Floyd had over 2,000 men. Uh, Tyler only had about approximately 1,000. Um, so the battle took place and the they were caught off guard and they ran around like chickens with their heads cut off and um, they a, a slight number of them escaped and made their way back to Yali Bridge and gave their report to General Cox but um, the, the ones of the 7th who suffered the most casualties was uh, Charlie Company, or Company C, for you civilians. Uh, they they suffered the most amount of uh, casualties. Um, on the Union side, there were 15 KIA, or killed in action. There was 20 WIA, or wounded in action, and 38 POWs, or prisoners of war. Uh, Floyd only suffered 40 uh, KIAs and or uh, WIAs. But this battle would lead later to the Battle of Carnifax the Ferry. Well, here we are in Nicholas County with our good friend, uh, Byron. And uh, Byron Tucker is behind us somewhere. Where is Byron at? There he is, right there. He's coming over here. A lollygagging and uh and we could talk that way about each other because we're all veterans out here so uh clint is with us today and you are a veteran of army you at united states army operation iraqi freedom uh just like pretty much everybody around here it seems like <laughs> it seems like west virginia always gives more than its fair share to the cause <laughs> so we're out here on private property and we're going to go and hunt around areas that are close to but not on the carnifex ferry battlefield so uh what we hope to find is maybe some overshot or maybe some bullets or campsites if we find a campsite that'd be really good gold, gold. Lost Confederate gold. yeah we've been looking for that one for a long time and I don't know if you can see Byron. He's way over there in the woods. I'm over here. Um, and we're trying to stay as far apart so that we don't get the bleed over. You can hear the metal detectors. They'll bounce around and make that noise. A lot of times that's because you'll get signals. You know, they get crossed with each other. And so you kind of kind of watch that. Haven't found anything yet, but this is a really cool spot. A lot of Civil War activity. So I'm pretty excited about this. I think we're going to find something. And I think we're going to find something majorly cool today. And we'll bring it to you here on Digging History. And uh, also Extreme Appalachian Adventures. So keep watching. Wear your bug spray. You can't find it sitting on the couch. Get up. Get to digging. God bless. Okay, folks. Down here on Digging History. At Kessler's Cross Lanes on a private property site. And I have found the first fired bullet. Wow, look at that sucker, man. Ooh. And I think that's a Confederate bullet. Holy cow, 69 caliber. It's huge. Wow, take a look at it, everybody. It might have been dropped. I think it's I think it's been hit by a plow down here. But this is this is it. So we're gonna hit this area pretty good. Uh, that's the pretty good, first good find for the day. So uh, we'll keep looking on digging history. Keep watching at Kessler's Cross Lanes in Nicholas County, the Battle of Kessler's Cross Lanes. So uh, this was this was fired. I, that right there is an old plow mark. They plowed this whole field, I'm sure. So, anyways but still a really cool find. Now, if you look up on the hill there, there's a stick sticking out of the ground. It's kind of brown. That's where I found the first bullet. Well, I came down here about 40 meters down and check it out. So I found a round ball. Now, I'm not sure if, uh, yeah, this is a round ball, uh, probably from a buck and ball round. Uh, fortunately, this one was not hit 
uh, by a tractor, but it did something did hit it. Um, but from the American Civil War, the Battle or Battle of Kessler's Cross Lane. So that's the second bullet I found in this little area, and that's what you got to do. You got to look, mark where you find your first one, and then just do a circumference. You can either do a circular or a zigzag pattern, but don't go further than a hundred yards and see what you find in that area 100 yards to the left 100 yards to the right north south east west and zigzag and crisscross that area until you search that whole area and look that's how i find the artifacts can't find it sitting on the couch folks get up get to digging man this is most likely this is most likely a union uh buck and ball round so and that other round I found was a Confederate bullet. Well, that's pretty cool, you know, 69 caliber uh, Confederate round. Boom, boom, man, look at that. A lot of mus musketry up here um, in this area. So you can't find it sitting on the couch. And the signal is very, very hard to get. You know, you'd think in this field, you'd pick it right up. The signals are faint, folks, very faint. Uh, but you have to you have to really listen and pay attention, and uh, and you'll find them. Okay, folks, got Byron over here. He's on a pretty good iron signal. This is in his like in his front yard now. Okay, <laughs> so this is, <laughs> wouldn't it be cool to live in an area? Yeah, he's found something. He's found something. It looks like a piece of wire. Oh, well. It's better than finding nothing. <laughs> yeah. Can't find it sitting on the couch, folks. That's exactly right. You got to get out and get to digging. And boy, oh boy, it is my lucky day. This is the third bullet I have found at the Battle of Kessler's Cross Lanes. And this is a Spencer Carbine bullet, friends. So I have found... A little bit of everything out here that was a very hard signal to get and it wasn't very deep either so spencer carbine bullet so so we found a spencer carbine we found well, that's not a real bullet but i did find that out there somebody's been out there shooting a slingshot um a round ball and a big old confederate 69 caliber Man, that is so cool. All at the Battle of Kessler's Cross Lanes on a piece of private property uh, that's probably been hunted over. We've dug a lot of trash. You just gotta keep digging. That's all you gotta do, keep digging. Don't give up. So this is my fourth bullet I found today. Remember that story I told you about being the bullet magnet? Yeah, it's true pretty much anywhere I go. There it is, another bullet going in the pocket. You can't find it sitting on the couch. Get out, get the digging. God bless you. Have a good day. Okay, folks, we're out here on some private property at Kessler's Cross Lanes in that area uh, in West Virginia. And I've, I've come up on a signal here. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's down there deep enough and it's given me that bullet signal. How about that, right? <laughs> uh, um, but I'm not sure yet, so I'm not gonna get my hopes up. We've uh, been out here, uh, of course I got out here a little later than everybody else because I got a further way to drive, but been out here for a couple of hours anyways. So, my theory, and it's just a theory, is that they ran these ridge lines here. And, and while these fields, I'm sure, at one time probably held a tremendous number of artifacts, I'm not so sure they have them now. Uh, Uh, 
Um, but we'll see. Oh man, that thing's giving me fits. Come on, you. Okay. Have to get the, the big machine out to find, <laughs> pinpoint it again. Oh boy. You know, that happens sometimes. Where are you? You're right there. Right there on the top. Ah, it is a bullet. Ah, but it's a modern bullet, folks. Ah, nothing. Nothing special, but anyways, we'll put it in the bag and we'll carry it out of here. That's one less thing that somebody else can find later and a little less trash in the field. Thank you for watching Digging History. We want to send out a special thank you to the West Virginia Library Commission for their support and access to books and historical articles that help us locate and bring history alive. Remember that some of the greatest adventures is just a short trip to your local library. And even now, under the current COVID-19 situation, you can use your internet and you can find things that you never thought existed in your state. We also want to thank the West Virginia Library Television Network and Beth Garrigal, our producer, who donates her time and energy to this project. In addition, we wish to thank Fisher Research Labs in Texas for providing us technical and material support to make this show a success and also to our special guests Byron Tucker, U.S. Navy veteran and Clint Ridenour, Army Iraq War veteran who went digging with us and helped us gain access to private property sites that turned up some awesome relics. Folks, have an awesome day and remember that a day digging history beats a day on the couch. So get to digging.